We landed on the moon with a 2 megahertz computer that cost in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. And these days, you can have 244 megahertz in your pocket for less than the price of a cup of coffee. Those iconic early Apple desktop computers had 233 megahertz but cost almost $1,300. And nowadays, for about $5, you can get those 244 megahertz with built-in Wi-Fi. And if you want something ultra low power, you can spend about $2 and get a chip that can run on a coin cell battery for over a year. It's just ridiculous. We live in the freaking future and have no reason to not be building awesome things these days. Hello and welcome to Fluxbench. My name is James and I'm a nerd and I hope you're a nerd too. And today we're talking about what do you do after you get through with your development boards? Do you just stick around using them forever or how do you actually start making your own stuff? It's a lot easier than you probably think. Step one is as simple as find what you want to do. Find a development board or like an ESP32 chip or something that you want to turn into something awesome. Step two is basically make a clone of that development board. And if you don't have a development board available for that chip, well, scroll down on that data sheet and just find that typical application circuit. And we're going to basically be ripping this off one to one. We're just trying to get it working. And then step three, that's the fun part. We're gonna go and make it your own board. You're gonna add different sensors and features. You can change the shape. You can just add anything you want or move anything you want, but it's as simple as find the chip, clone it, make it your own. And you can pretty much build all your future devices for about less than a price of a lunch. When you're getting started in electronics, these dev boards or development boards are about the best thing in the world for you. If you're trying to learn how to ride a bike, you don't make your own custom bike from scratch. You basically go down to Walmart and buy one for 100 or 200 bucks, something cheap. So when you're starting out in electronics, dev boards are plenty good enough. But at some point, you're going to want to start tweaking things, swapping out parts, making little modifications, or you're just starting to go and just add a lot of things. And before you know it, there's just too many dang wires and too much soldering. I mean, stuff works until one wire pops loose somewhere randomly and then you stare at this tangled mess wondering, where do I even begin debugging it? And that's when you realize the problem, it's not in your components, it's not in your code, it's in the connections. So that's why you make a circuit board. It's all those same parts, all those same connections, but all those connections are built right into the copper and they are rock solid. No jumper wires to fail, no guessing what thing pulled out or broke. If your PCB works the first time, it's going to work every time after unless you physically rip off a component and that's just not going to happen. So assembly, that gets faster too. A complex board, it takes hours to assemble, but if you try to hand solder it, you're going to be measuring that in days. So we live in the freaking future where power efficiency and miniaturization also come from going smaller, mounting directly on the surface, getting denser, and getting more efficient. Every phone, smartwatch, every modern gadget you've ever touched is built the same way for a reason. But I don't want you to hate development boards, just understand what they are. They're definitely not called production boards. So if you stay on a dev board forever, you're going to stay in development forever. So let's just move on and see how easy it is to leave this beginner world behind and step into the professional one. It doesn't matter if you're making one PCB or five or five million, the process is the same. You definitely don't need an electrical engineering degree to do this. All you really need is to be able to blink an LED on a Arduino, hook up some sensors and just do the basics. And then you're probably ready to step up. You got to find some reason to do this. Either you got some chips that you just can't buy together on some board from AliExpress or Amazon, or you're just kind of tired of all these janky wires and all these solder connections. But whatever it is, you got to find something cool enough, a reason, a motivation to really step up your game. If you have a specific chip or dev board that you want to use, then great. You can kind of skip the rest of this part. But if you don't, Time to go shopping, time to go and look up from all these big companies to see what they have on their websites. If you want something with Wi-Fi and fast, grab an ESP32 from Espresso. They have all different makes and models. If you want something more hardcore industrial, check out the MSP430 line from Texas Instruments. But if you want some ultra low power thing like the STM32L0, check out ST Micro. But they have chips for everything. I mean, from 50 cent chips up to $50, basically anything in your budget, anything that you need, they're probably gonna have a chip to do it at ST Micro. So browse the websites, find something, click on it, and what you're gonna find is everything has a data sheet with it. But when you click on it and open it, don't panic about the jargon. Just don't freak out if you don't understand every term, 
But most importantly, just start checking out data sheets. Eventually they stop being scary. And that's where the real engineering is. If you're gonna go and buy a car, you're gonna look up the specs. How much horsepower does it have? How many miles per gallon does it get? This is where all that stuff is. This is like where you'd find that towing capacity. If you need to tow 10,000 pounds, if this truck says it tows 8,000 pounds, well, don't get yourself a Toyota Tacoma. Skim the data sheet, don't panic, and just scroll down until you get to that typical application circuit. That's where this little diagram is, and it's basically your cheat sheet. It's gonna show you every part you need to make this chip come alive. You're gonna be surprised about how few parts it takes. That STM32G0 from their budget line, it takes like a couple capacitors and resistors and that's it. An ESP32, same thing, but just add a couple buttons and maybe a few extra bits and bobs. Most chips are practically turnkey. So now that we found the chip we want to use, we're going to go and just add it to our EDA, or basically our CAD program for electronics. We're going to drop it into the schematic, and that way we can start making our clone. If you're missing some of the prerequisite knowledge to go from a Arduino board to an ESP32 or your own custom board, well, if it's math or science or computer science or even digital circuits, Today's sponsor, Brilliant, can help get you closer. They have all sorts of courses from the classic math that you've seen before, all the different types of science, but the thing is, once you get into digital circuits, then that's when you really can start to understand how stuff like this Arduino here works. It uses the same advanced protocols as this ESP32, I2C, UART, SPI, but they're all based on incredibly fundamentally simple things. So if you learn about the digital circuits, you're gonna be learning how these guys work. To learn for free on Brilliant, go to brilliant.org slash Fluxbench, scan the QR code on screen, or click the link in the description. Brilliant's also given our viewers 20% off an annual premium subscription, which gives you unlimited daily access to everything on Brilliant. At this stage, you're not trying to make the most amazing thing in the world. You're just trying to go from like zero to one, from nothing to something that actually just even works. If you've already got a development board, then that's a perfect place to start because instead of going just to like the raw chip on the board data sheet, you can try to go and pull up a development kit data sheet or whatever documentation they have around that. Sometimes they call it a development kit instead of a development board because what they're really trying to tell you is that the chip data sheet will tell you what it needs to boot and be programmed. But the development board or kit documentation will tell you how to basically build that whole little computer thing around it. You know, everything that you need to be able to plug this in. So that's the difference between theory and something you can actually use is that development kit, all those headers, all those extra little bits and bobs they have around it. But most companies will give you basically the whole playbook. They'll tell you, here's the schematic of how everything's connected. Here's the exact part numbers that we used in our development board. They'll even give you some downloadable design files that you can open up in your ECAD program like Altium or KiCad or Easy EDA. But that's going to be your starting point. You're going to go to these schematics or whatever, and you're going to copy it. You're going to rebuild it in your program, and then you're going to send it off to have it made, assemble it, and see if you can even make it boot. So the reason why you basically want to just copy it is you're trying to create it like a scientific experiment. You're trying to keep the constants constant. So that way the same parts are used with the same connections and every change that you make from this original schematic is a new variable. Every new variable is another risk. So you can always tweak things later, but first prove you can make it work. So you build the clone. Maybe you hand assemble it or you get it made at some place like JLC PCB where they can make both the PCB and assemble it for you, but the goal is gonna be the same. You just want to get this thing powered, talk to it, and get it to do something stupid simple like blink an LED. What you're trying to figure out is, when you plug it in, does the magic smoke escape? Does the power supply shut off because it detected a short somewhere? Did a capacitor go pop? Well, if you can boot it and program it, congratulations. You just went from zero to one. That's the whole purpose of this maneuver. And, well, you just made a working computer from scratch but normally it's gonna be a little bit more than you do than just that. One of two things are gonna happen when you plug in your board, either something really boring or really exciting. And that exciting stuff can be bad exciting or good exciting. Most of the time it's bad exciting. If you have a current limiting power supply, I'd recommend using it. I mean, set those amps or that current limit to low and then plug your board in for just a second then unplug it. Did the LEDs flash on? 
Did your power supply shut off? Did you see any sparks anywhere? And if you don't have a thermal camera, use your original diagnostic tools, your fingers and your nose. After you plugged in the board for a second, use your fingers and touch around the board. Is anything feeling warmer than it should? Just be careful that there's no capacitors that you're touching with your fingers and short circuiting. You don't want to accidentally electrocute yourself. But for all intents and purposes, you should be able just to feel around with your fingers, smell with your nose. If something's hot or smells weird, something's wrong. If something gets too hot too fast, you probably have a short. Sometimes it's not in your design. Sometimes you added too much solder or there's a stray blob of something or a wire or debris or something under a chip that's basically bridging that power to ground. You're kind of making like a, a little resistor that shouldn't exist and it's just dumping power where it shouldn't. So let's say everything goes well. If all the magic smoke stays inside and nothing's glowing red hot that shouldn't be glowing red hot, that's a good sign. So grab a USB power meter or look at your benchtop power supply and see how much power it's pulling. If it's reasonable, you know, maybe increase that amp limit a little bit on that benchtop power supply, plug it in. Is it staying within what you think it should be using? If so, time to flash some firmware on it. But let's not go crazy yet. Like. Flash a simple hello world or a simple like blink LED program. The goal here is like with aliens to make first contact. You're just trying to like talk to the board for the first time. And once it blinks, once it kind of has a little bit of proof of life, I like to start turning on things bit by bit. Or if you're feeling confident, just turn on every GPIO chip output that you can. Basically, every single pin that can turn on or off on that chip you basically turn it on for a second or two, and then you turn it off, and then turn it on and turn it off. And so you should be able to go around with a multimeter and basically probe that each pin really toggles between zero volts and 3.3 volts, or zero volts and five volts, depending on what your board should be outputting. And if it does, you know the brain's alive, talking and well. But after that, I really start shaking the tree, trying each additional sensor in its own separate test, trying to talk to new things, and I really treat it like a test drive, easy at first, and just kind of ramp up the power oomph and complexity over time once I get more confident. But if I find something doesn't work, I don't freak out. It happens to us all. You just got to try to figure out what's the root of the problem. So the next step is just to go and try to figure out what type of problem it is and where it is. Such as if it's a power problem, you have power coming in the board and you measure 5 volts with your multimeter, for example, and you can track 5 volts a couple places and then all of a sudden it turns into 0 volts and you're out of power. Well, you just try to figure out where you went from power to no power and what component or what could be causing it. Look in the schematics and look at the traces in your PCB to try to figure out what could be causing it. Where did you go from working to not working? But let's say you have power everywhere and your board just won't boot up for whatever reason. Sometimes things like an LED are just turned around backwards. Well, you know, that's a very simple fix, but other things like a microcontroller are a little bit more complicated, such as why isn't it powering on even though it has power? That's where you really just go back to the data sheet, look at the dev kit, schematics and diagrams, and just try to figure out what did you do differently? Is that where the problem actually is coming from? and then just try to fix it. Make your changes, make another board, populate it, turn it on, go through all these steps again, and hopefully it's working this time. If all the lights come on and the board stays cold and all that magic smoke magically stays inside the components, well, that's what you've been waiting for. Congratulations, you went from zero to one and built yourself a working computer. But even though that's awesome, it's still a clone. Now. It's time to make this thing your own. If you use jumper wires to add a sensor, let's just put those both directly on the PCB. You want a button? Let's add it. You want fewer headers? Remove them. I usually just keep power, ground, and the pins I need for programming. Everything else connects straight to sensors and switches. Think about it like a scientific experiment again. Which one of these components and connections are the things you want to keep constant, and which one and what are the things you want to make variables that, if you change them, they're probably going to be the things that break if something goes wrong. Maybe you used a simple linear regulator in your first board. Fine, but inefficient. You can swap it out for a buck converter and gain some efficiency. You want to add a couple LEDs? Cool! Add a sensor or two, tweak some resistor values, but little by little, it stops being a clone and it starts being your design. 
Every time you change something, you're testing your understanding. You already know the base design works, so each experiment just builds on that confidence. And that's kind of the magic of that one, two, three approach. You find the chip, you make the clone, get it working, and then you can customize it and make it yours. So let's order this new board, assemble it, bring it up the same way before. We're gonna check the voltages, flash the firmware, and watch it come alive again. But this time, it's yours. It isn't some typical application circuit. It's not someone else's recipe. It's your device for the freaking future. And now that it's truly yours, it deserves a body. Let's give it one. So now that you can make something awesome, what are you going to do with it? There's a reason nobody sells just a naked PCB at the store. Everything has some sort of enclosure for practicality, looks, safety. It's like putting a hood over car engine. Everyone just does it for a good reason. So whether this board lives inside some bigger product or just needs its own little shell, it's time to mount it somehow. That usually means adding holes so that way you can use screws, bolts, pegs, or whatever works to secure down that PCB. And now you have to start balancing those physical requirements. How big can it be? That's more of a chicken and the egg problem than anything. Maybe you need to have tall capacitors or maybe it has to stay real skinny. But once you got that figured out, you might then run into the problem of where do you put your buttons and screens and lights? Because sometimes one big PCB is just not practical. You need to put your brains on one board and your interface like your buttons or your screen or speakers or whatever on some other board and then just run wires between them and keep that design clean. You're not just wiring things together anymore. You're deciding how they're going to live in the real world, where they're going to mount, how it feels to use them. If you drop this thing, is it going to survive? And at this point, you can build the brains, connect sensors, mount switches and wrap it all in a body and you're not tinkering now. You're making real things. And once this thing's alive and working, there's just one question left. What are you going to build next? There are a few things that changed how I look at this world. Getting a degree in finance, money stopped being a mystery. Learning to program, algorithms suddenly just made sense. But it wasn't until I made my first circuit board, powered it on, and saw my own code running on it that I finally felt like I understand how this modern world works. We live in a digital world made of invisible systems, but there's those of us who use electronics and those of us who make electronics. Do you just want to sit around while everyone else has fun making magic or do you just want to make some magic yourself? Even if you don't want to start a company or sell a product, I hope you at least make something like this uh, just once, at least once. Because after you do, you'll understand how the sausage is made. And when you look at any gadget, you'll almost like be able to see inside it. You'll get it. You'll probably know what's in there, how it works. And when something breaks, you have a good guess at what failed first. Whether your dream is small or huge, this is the path. If you want to scale, if you want to turn an idea into a million units, this is how. And if you want to just make one thing that's yours, this is still the best way. Maybe you're just tired of soldering jumper wires and having things fall apart. Maybe you just want to stop tinkering and start finishing something. But mostly, I hope you do it because I think it'll change the way you see the world. We landed on the moon with two megahertz and now you can have 240 in your pocket for less than $8. You can make anything you want these days. I hope nothing's holding you back, nothing cheesy like your imagination, and nothing real like the fears we all have as human beings. But whatever it is that you want to make, I hope you go out there and make something awesome. You got this.